episode of iFanboy. I'm Ron. I'm Connor. And I'm Josh. And we're here at the New York Comic Con 2008. Uh, this year, it's a bigger room. There's there's much more space. It's not February, so it's a beautiful day outside. Yeah. Short sleeves, short sleeves. Oh. It's a wonder what the non-snow does to you. It's yeah. amazing. So uh, We are here to talk to creators and show you what it looks like here. So we've got a lot of work to do. Let's get started. I'm here with Cliff Chang. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I, now, you had sort of a circuitous rise to get to being a working artist. You were an editor? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I started working at Vertigo uh, maybe around like 97, 98, and uh, worked there as an assistant editor for two years. And then after a while, working in the office, I I had always been drawing at home, you know, after I got you know back from work. And uh, I realized if I was ever going to become you know, a freelance artist, I had to just commit to it 100%. Right. So after two years, I, I left and went freelance. Cool. Um, most recently, uh, you, you've been known for doing Green Arrow, Black Canary. Was that was that a fun book? That looked like it was just a ton of fun. Sure. I mean, uh, most of the comics that I've done, I guess, have been for Vertigo over the last you know uh, five or six years. So, it's uh, it was fun for me to finally get to do superheroes just all out. You know, and I really like the way Judd Winnick writes superheroes because he kind of looks at it from like you know slightly askew. You know, he he puts superheroes in weird situations, and he always. Um, concentrates on like the the characters and the humanity of them mm -hmm. so you know it was, it was a lot of fun and we got to do some you know some kooky stuff yeah. do, you, do you find that like the sort of the market is more amenable to your style now sort of the the cleaner lines and I guess it's it's cartoony but it's it's also not overly rendered or anything uh, I don't know I think I think the market is kind of weird it, it's hard to know what to make of it I mean because you know a lot of my stuff has been for you know smaller books mm -hmm. um, now that you know people have gotten a chance to see it, uh, you know they've responded to it. But I think you know there's always been a market for that cleaner look. But at the same time, if you look around, a lot of the guys who are really really popular are not that you yeah. know at the same time. So it's like I think there's a lot of space for a lot of different types of artwork. Cool. Um, so so what's what's coming up next? You're 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 done with Green Arrow for now, and uh, what what can we look forward to? Well, I'm still going to be on the covers for Green Arrow, so right. you'll see me on the stands every month at least that way, and then. Uh, I'm working on a graphic novel for Vertigo called Greendale, and uh, it should be out late next year. And, and are you writing that, or? or? Uh, no, it's being written by Josh Dysart, and it's actually uh, kind of a funny project. It's based on a concept album by Neil Young that came out like a few years ago, and uh, he's kind of overseeing the, the whole creative process. He's like, you know, he's vetting the scripts and, and looking at artwork. So, um, but we're expanding on it and, and really deepening some of the themes in it. And, and it's really, you know, kind of a cool story. It's about, you know, this young girl who has kind of nature powers and lives in Northern California. And, and um, a lot of crazy stuff happens once uh, a guy who may or may not be the devil blows into town. And, uh, you know, by the end of it, it it's a coming of age story. Okay. Pretty much. And, and do you get notes from Neil Young then? Uh, I haven't yet. Uh, we're really early in the process, but uh, I, I I'm guessing I will. <laughs> so we came here this morning looking for the line for our typical line shot. We couldn't find it. Couldn't find any people. Couldn't anywhere. find anybody. Then I heard shouting in the distance, and then we turned the corner here, and it's like Ellis Island. It's there's refugees. It's like a refugee it's like, camp. It's like a refugee camp of con goers. Some have been here for hours. I was talking to some of them earlier. They were they've been here since since eight seven eight a.m. This is dedication. And I mean, this is this is crazy. I've never seen so many people in one room in my life. They're in the pens. Um, so this is the line to get in to the con, and this is actually the room where the convention was last year. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of this line. I am here with Mike Norton. Hi. And shouldn't you be drawing something right now? Yes. And it's not good that you got me on film, because now I can't, there's no plausible deniability now. <laughs> now, now you're pulling off a monthly book, yes. plus a weekly book. Sort How? Of. <laughs> Maybe in a way. Well, and monthly, it's like uh, they only give me a couple weeks at a time. It's not like I'm doing it <laughs> as they go. <laughs> I gotta do. I gotta send this off. It's coming out next week. So there's, there's a lot of guys who can't do the one monthly book. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not trying to brag or anything. You know, it's just, just that good. No, <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. Um, I've only done three weeks so far, so okay. so far it's a breeze. <laughs> um, now. You do you have a style, or are you the are you just a chameleon? Like, is there one thing that you would say, like, if you were doing like your own creator own book? Uh, that's wow. Wait a I don't want to put you on the spot. spot. <laughs> I did. Um, I I'd like to think I do, but I don't know exactly what that is right now. I mean, I am totally like I was saying. I'm artistically schizophrenic. I. I draw something and the next thing looks completely different and I, it's, it's helped me out so far just because I can 
pitch hit for whoever. But um, at the end of the day, sometimes you're like, well, who am I really? And then you sit there and you cry and uh, then you draw some more. But I, uh, I, I think I have a style. It's just it's sort of reminiscent of other people that have come before me. It's kind of like I, I really I like a lot of the old classic kind of stuff. Like I was saying, I wanted to go meet John Romita today just because those are the kind of comics I started reading that and John Byrne. And, um, but I really like a lot of the slick, stripped down cartoony elements like a Mike Parabek or Mike Waringo, that kind of stuff. So I try to blend those two. And I think that's who I am if I was left to myself. But mm -hmm. that happens so rarely because a lot of my professional career has been stepping in after somebody else and them saying, well, we don't want to shock everybody. Mm -hmm. So I just do that. Well, I mean, there's the line that I see going through everything is that there's a, a lot of really clean lines. It's not like overly stylized or rendered, yeah. strong storytelling, things like that. I mean, those are the kind of things you, you concentrate on, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I like the, the structure underneath all the details more than I like the details. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to have like an action rather than spend a lot of time on cross action in a background or something mm -hmm. like that. And that's what I'm trying to do. I think the stuff I'm doing on Green Arrow, Black Canary now, which nobody's seen yet because I'm on issue nine, is a lot more like me than most of the stuff I've done before. Just like I think a lot of the, uh, the Adam stuff I was doing at the end was a lot more like me than it was John Byrne, for instance. Right. Um, so, I mean, when that comes out, I think, I think it'll be easier to tell, but I'm, it's impossible for me not to be influenced by all the people that I'm just so fascinated by as far as, like, artistically. Are you having fun on Green Arrow, Black Canary? I'm having tons of fun. It's a lot like uh, Adam in that it's nonstop action and nonstop funny. <laughs> you know, Gail is so awesome at the funny end. Uh, and Judd makes, I like, I like Oliver Queen. I didn't know that much about him, honestly, before I got into this. And he's a really funny character at his core, you know. He's just, he'll shoot you with an arrow and then make a joke about it. So I mean. Let me ask you about the, uh, the one panel in, in issue seven, I think it was. Uh, it was, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? The, the one page, the, the honka, I believe. Yeah. How much script did you get on that and how much did you put into it? Um, it was actually pretty well thought out. He... <laughs> He, he had the beat down, like he, he, he had seen this as a movie in his head, which is worrisome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was easy to translate just because he, he knew that he wanted to do a beat panel. They just have like just sitting there and then do the honk. It wasn't my, hmm, this needs to linger a little bit more. He actually knew that's what he wanted to do. So I won't take credit for it, but. It, and the leather sheep was that? The, le uh, the leather sheep was actually, I mean, there was supposed to be a sheep there, but I. <laughs> I made him the leather sheep. That's what I'm saying. It's you. That's what we want. It's, it's, it's not kinky enough to have a sheep there. He's got to be a super freak sheep. So when you walk into the convention, you want to keep your eyes peeled to, to make sure you catch everything. And it's a, it's a nice carpet. Wow. This is spongy. Tokyo Pop. Nice. Way to, way to deliver the carpet. So I'm here with Andy Lanning here in Artist Alley. How you doing, Andy? Please meet you. Excellent. So, um, so before we talk about anything else, I need to give you a heartfelt thank you for the work you've done on Nova. <laughs> that was a moment. That was fantastic. Nova is one of my favorite characters of all time, and it, and it seems that he's been maligned through the years. He's never been able to catch catch it with the audience since he was introduced in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. But this new, this new series is fantastic. I, I mean, uh, like you, I, he, he was one of the heroes I grew up with. Yeah. I was saying this earlier, is that, um, I bought the first issue of Nova, and when you're a kid and you can get on something from the issue one, you feel you own that character. Yeah. yeah. And, and Nova, like you, exactly the same, both me and Dan. Yeah. And it's just wonderful to be able to write stories about a character that you've grown up reading stories about. So yeah. we're, we're absolutely uh, in our element. Yeah. So when they, so when you got the title of the book, and, and, I, and it's ongoing, right? There's no yeah, end in sight. Yeah. yeah. So um, how do you approach that, given the back history and all the kind of stuff? Did you just try to forget, it, like, the 90s and forget the brown costume? And Well, um, to, to be fair, it's like uh, I never read that stuff in the 90s. That was, nice. I mean, so, uh, I mean, if... if, if 
it'll be good at some point to get those issues, reference them and see if we can make some stuff out of that. But I mean, we just went back to the pure Nova uh, Centurion and Nova core idea. There is continuity there. We're not ignoring it. We'll weave it in as we, as we go along. Hopefully we, we'll have a, a long, long extended run on the book and we'll be able to go back, play with stuff. But yeah, we, we wanted to get back to the, uh, the essence of the, of the character uh, because that was so good. Yeah. And then just represent that to the modern audience because because the character's so good people need to see that yeah like I, when it, when he first came out he had more he was another teen superhero kind of thing you guys are taking more of a science fiction bent yeah 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 I mean um, to me again um, yeah that was great and then Nova on Earth but obviously Earth's full of heroes yep. and, and Nova's a cosmic uh, a cosmic guardian you know so uh, it was like let's get him out there yeah. and, and the annihilation event obviously just put him in that realm right and and we love sci-fi stuff anyway yeah. um, and uh, and it just gave us a chance again to play with concepts and ideas that uh, you know you don't normally see in comic books yeah. so the annihilation event has been pretty big at marvel how much of a launch pad for stories has that been is that you know it's kind of seems that it's a thread through all the science fiction books oh yeah yeah i mean you know it's it, 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 that's just the wonder of uh, keith giffen basically that guy you know a million and one ideas that you something he'll just you know, he'll throw it out as a, a side and you'll go, yeah, but that's such a great idea. Let's run with that. So, yeah, it is. It's rich pickings. I mean, it's, um, it, it's a, it, like you say, it's the spine to the whole the whole book. Yeah. So there are a lot of criticisms to Nova that he's, uh, too, he's, like, he's like Marvel's Green Lantern. Uh, what, what is your response to that? I, 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 yeah, well, exactly. I mean, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, so, so. Yeah. It's like they're both space cops. Right. I mean, you can't get, and that, and the concept of space cops was before, was around before Green Lantern. Yeah. But it's like, okay, he doesn't wear green. He hasn't got a power battery. Yeah. No little blue guys running around on a planet called Oa. Yeah. I mean, it's like, that's Green Lantern. And Green Lantern, again, is fantastic. Yeah. I love what Jeff's doing with that at the moment. And we're, and we're doing our stuff with Nova. I think, yeah, there's similarities. Yeah. I mean, around that time again in the 70s, they were ripping each other off, left, right, and center. You yeah. know, it's like, well, you do Green Lantern, we'll do Nova. You know, you do, uh, uh, you do Batman, we'll do The Punisher. You know, it's like, yeah. everything's got its own echo. So anyone who, I, I don't think that's a criticism. Yeah. I really don't think that's, it's, it's just kind of like one of those, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, I agree with you. So, um, so you're right, you're a writing partner, Dan Abnett. How does that process work together when you guys are writing? I mean, do you? Um... Um, yeah, well, I, I basically, I, I do 99.9% .9 of the work and, uh, and, and, you know, and I just, you know, I keep Dan around because yeah. he's a very sad, lonely man and, you know, uh, <laughs> not really. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a, we got a cool process. We, we've been doing this for, together now for, I think, over 15 years now. You guys did the last stuff for 2000 AD, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and um, we were working on the Punisher uh, uh, for Marvel ages ago. Um, yeah, we, we, we get together and we just, you know, basically bounce ideas backwards and, um, and forwards. And then we'll rough out the issue. I'll do like a, a, a rough page breakdown to everything. And Dan goes away and writes up the script and does some dialogue in. Yeah. And uh, that he'll then send that to me. We'll you know, tighten up. That, and then that goes off to Bill Roseman, who tends to, at that point, decide he didn't like that idea in the first place. <laughs> and he wants it all rewritten. Ah, but so then it makes it easy for you, really. Yeah. But then he's an editor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. Well, we love. I love the book. We love it. We would tell our fans too. So thank you so much. Oh and no, and, and uh, obviously, if you like the Nova stuff, yeah. I think you're really going to like the Guardians of the Galaxy stuff as I, well. I'm actually I'm an old Guardians of the Galaxy fan too, so oh, I'm excited yeah. for that. Yeah, so hitting, what do you guys have planned? What do you guys have planned for that one? Oh well, again, uh, more of the same. I mean, it's yeah. uh, it's set in the cosmic universe, yeah. and we're again to expand that. Take because obviously Nova being a single character, you you've got a very specific mission that you want to take him on. Yeah. With the Guardians, we're getting to play with, again, characters. I mean, where can you get to see uh, Rocket Raccoon so, uh, exactly. and Groot yeah. facing off against Cosmo? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so are you going to be uh, tapping in on any of the old Guardians of the Galaxy? I mean, like, uh, uh, in a... Yeah, no, that definitely. Um, Cyanex you know, and, and I mean, Starhawk. <laughs> I mean, I, Starhawk is probably going to be around. Awesome. Um, I mean, yeah, um, what, we've, what we've done, though, is we're not kind of... Uh, redoing the Guardians in that yeah. format. We've, we've quite literally taken the name. They are yeah. the Guardians of the Galaxy. That's their job. Right. They are the Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy. But it would be silly, yeah. having been given the uh, uh, by Marvel, let us use that name, right. not to feed some of those characters. Because there's a legacy there. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we want to be respectful to that, to the people who read that in the past. And, and, and again, hopefully we'll go back, delve into that stuff, and then uh, you know, weave it into some of our future stories. Cool, excellent. Well, I'll definitely be reading it.
So the Javits Center, where the convention is, is a big place, and the New York Con isn't taking over all of it. At the same time as the New York Comic Con, the uh, Club Industry East Expo is going on. I don't want to go for the easy joke here, but I'm going to. If there were ever two populations of people who had nothing to do with one another, <laughs> the, 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 the fitness club industry, you know, equipment, the, I saw an elliptical, looked really yeah. nice. What is that? Uh, it's the, the thing. <laughs> here with Jason Aaron, writer of Scalped, Eisner nominated Scalped. I have a question. How, I feel like it's very authentic. I mean, I don't know, because I've never been to Indian Reservation, but I feel like it is. Is, is, is it? Or did you, I mean, I hope so to some extent. You know, it's, I mean, it's still a crime book, so it's not going to be a documentary. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, hopefully there's something that, that, that it seems relevant, seems socially relevant, and it really strikes a chord with people. Do you do, do, you do a lot of, how, how does the research process work for, for a book like Scalp? You know, just like with the other side, it's a lot of reading, a lot of talking to people. I, I could have sworn you would have grown up in a reservation or near a reservation. It was just—it seemed to me so unlike every other book out there, in, in a sense that it really felt like, like that. Well, thanks, but no. You know, and then I wrote a Vietnam War book, and I've never been to Vietnam either, obviously. So, how how long do you have a planned out for? Do you have a do you have a an ending in mind, or is it an open-ended story? No, I mean, there's a, a definite ending in mind. There are definite character arcs for all these characters. But in terms of a specific issue number, no, I, I haven't thrown anything out there. But, you know, just as long as we're having fun, as long as the stories are still coming, you know, we'll keep doing it. How was the, how did you, how was the reaction to the book? I mean, the reaction's been very strong. Was it surprising? Were you, were you shocked by that reaction? Well, sure. I, I mean, I had, I had no idea what to expect because I was still totally new when the book started. And, you know, but it's really the book that's, that's given me a comic career. As a, that book has led to everything I've done with Marvel. I've seen one thing for sure with this book is you get a lot of creators who really love it. It's like Garth, guys like Garth Ennis, Ru Baker talk about it a lot. Do you, was that I mean was that a surprise to you as a new as a new writer? You had these guys who are big names in the industry. Yeah, that was, that was a huge thrill. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm still a fanboy when I when I meet those guys. So yeah. having them know your work and and, and enjoy it, it just uh, makes me all giddy inside. Yeah. So how does how does the relationship work with the artist? Where's where's he from? Gareth's Serbian, but he lives in Spain. Uh, so how do you communicate? Well, we, through emails constantly. Uh, we talk on the phone occasionally. Uh, but he's, he's, his English is really good, and he's yeah. super passionate about what he does. Always has great ideas. How much of a collaboration goes on there between the look of the book and... A lot, a yeah. lot, a lot of collab collaboration. There's a lot of give and take. You know, sometimes I'll throw a scene out there, and what you get back is like, well, it's not what I wrote, but it's great. You know, and there's, there's all that give and take is what makes uh, comics so exciting. Yeah. So how, how would you describe, for the people who don't read, read the book, how would you describe the main character, Bad Horse? Uh, a badass uh, <laughs> with nunchucks. Uh, you know, just a, a, a young guy who grew up on this reservation who did everything he could to get away from it. Now he's been dragged back for reasons uh, beyond his control. And he's rebelling against it, rebelling against his, uh, his ancestry and everything. And, you know, really his internal struggle is kind of the main, the main story of the book. Was there was there a story you wanted to tell when you when you had the idea for the book? Say, I want this is this is beyond the crime aspect. Was there was there anything about Bad Horse you you wanted to, you wanted to explore? Yeah, just that that struggle with his cultural identity and then and, and really coming to appreciate you know where he was from and who he is. It's as much of a story as the as the as the crime in the background is his his, sure. his Indian struggle. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's the main arc of the story is is his journey. Yeah. Is there a, is there a true good guy and bad guy in Scalp? Would you would you say? A true, true good guy and a bad guy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's no. very gray. No, yeah, I hope it's all gray. Yeah. I mean, I think they're guys, you know, who do good things, who can do bad things. So the characters who are villains on one day and heroes on the other. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of have to figure out for yourself if, if who you who the hero is, if there is one. What's that smell? I don't know. It smells delicious. It's funnel cake. Funnel cake? Is funnel cake where? It's funnel, funnel cake. No funnel yeah. cake. Uh, funnel? No. Hey, so yeah, we're back from New York, um, another great convention in the bag, uh, just working on getting some of the footage all together here, and wait a minute, I didn't go, why am I doing this, I wasn't even there, wasn't there some other intern there, couldn't somebody else be telling you about Netflix.com slash iFanboy, somebody else could say, oh, they got 90,000 titles, and you pick what you want, and you know, they'll send it to you, there's no late fees, no delivery fees. I feel like that's somebody else's responsibility now. I'm done. I'm here with Neil Adams, 
And, and I, I would call you a legend, but you're not done working yet, obviously. No, I'm not done working. Is that what happens? Legends like become legends after they stop working? No, no I but, haven't stopped working. But clearly the work is legendary. L let me ask you, you champion a lot of creator rights and, the, and, and artists getting their pages back. Are you, are you satisfied with, with the way things are looking today? I won. That's all that matters. So all the artists here who are selling their own pages and stuff, you can look on that with a bit of pride, I guess? When we were doing, when we were having the fight to get the art, artwork returned, it took us seven years to get it done. There were artists who had, who were reluctant to support the idea that the artwork should get back to the artist because they felt it would be some kind of a offense to the publishers. I didn't quite understand why they were thinking that way because, of course, having the artwork returned cost the publishers nothing and it was the right thing to do. But they were still afraid. And I understood that. That's why I really didn't drag too many people into it. When those artists got their artwork back, the following year, they doubled their income. They didn't add 10% to their income, they doubled their income. Because they could sell their artwork or if they chose to not sell their artwork. Not too many of them came to me and said, Neil, that was a great idea. Because in the end, nobody likes to admit that maybe they were afraid. And I don't go around looking for it. When you do something because it's the right thing to do, you do it for the sake of it. And so I'm not looking for people to come around and say, boy, I'm glad you did that. But when I walk around and I see artists able to sell their stuff for the same price or double or triple what they get from the comic book companies, I do feel a little tinge in there that says, hey, that's pretty good. Uh, let, let me, I think that we have you to thank for the modern Batman. And I, I just want to oh. say thank you for all the fans. What, can you tell me a little about what it was like to go from sort of the, the campy Batman to the, to the more modern, I guess, more adult Batman we see today? Well. I would have to say that the more adult Batman that we see today was the original Batman. Then we had that lovely television show with Adam West and Burt Ward and all those old uh, actors who uh, played the various characters. And what happened was that DC Comics decided that that was the way to go. And so they did, their comic books were kind of like that. So you'd have Batman and Robin walking down the street in their long underwear and kids would walk by with their mommies and the kids didn't go, mommy, mommy, that man's walking by in his long underwear in the daytime. So, while I was at DC, I was doing other characters like Dead Man and Spectre. I don't even remember what I was doing at the time. So I went into Julie Schwartz's office and I said, Julie, uh, I'd like to do a Batman story. Julie said, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> So I said, no, no, really, I'd really like to do a Batman story. He said, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> so I came in the next day and I said, Julie, what I said yesterday, no, I'm serious, I would really like to do a Batman story. He said, close the door after you, get out. So I went down the hall to Murray Boltonoff's office who did a book called Brave and Bold. Brave and Bold had Batman, Aquaman, Batman, Hawkman, whatever it was that month, team book they called it. And I said to Murray, Murray, I, I'd love to do uh, some Brave and Bold. Murray said, hey, anytime, no problem. He knew, he got it. So he said, do you want to change the scripts? And I said, no, no, I just want to fudge it a little bit. Like if a scene takes place in the daytime, I'd rather it take place at night. If Batman walks in the door, I'd rather have him walk in a window, little things like that. Mm -hmm. He said, fine. After about three months, okay, you have to imagine you're on a movie set. You walk into DC Comics and the lighting man has come in and he's dimmed the lights in the hallway. Down at the end of the hall, there's Julie Schwartz and there's a spotlight on him. And long shadows are on his face. <laughs> and the hall is dark. And all the pictures are reflecting Julie Schwartz, Julie Schwartz down the hall and he's holding a bunch of letters. And he says, Adams, why do all these letters say the only Batman at DC 
is in brave and bold. <laughs> A little vindication. So I go down the hallway, and there's Julie, and he says, why do you think you know what Batman should be and the rest of us don't? I said, Julie, it's not just me who knows what Batman should be, but every kid in America knows what Batman ought to be, and it's not that guy on the TV show. He said, you're drawing Batman now. I said, OK. I had to quit doing Brave and Bold. <laughs> Then I did Batman. So we changed Batman. Unfortunately, the first three movies kind of followed the TV show in a way. I mean, they tried to be darker, but, you know, Keaton as Batman is not exactly. And the new one, I would have to say, and a lot of people are saying, that's Neil Adams' Batman. And I don't think that that's a wrong thing to say. And, it, and we waited a long time. But now we have Batman. You work in your continuity studios. You work in advertising primarily now. Do, do, you do you a lot of advertising. We do. I do. I do many things. If you were to go to my site, you go to a continuity site, uh, go to neilitems.com, or you will find that we do amusement park ride design, stage design, animatics, storyboards, comps, uh, finished commercials, uh, graphics of all sorts. Uh, it's an art studio. And it makes a very good living. It makes more than I could possibly make in comics. But I still love comics, so I still have to do comics. I was going to ask, do you, get to, do you get to scratch that itch enough? Well, I, not, in the last bunch of years, to be perfectly honest, I, first of all, I, when I stopped working with DC and Marvel, I started to, do, to work for Pacific Comics, and then I started to publish ourselves. So we had our own comic book publishing company, and we introduced a bunch of characters. When the crash came, when all those collectors kind of deserted the market, and uh, you don't remember it, but it was in the 90s. I remember. Remember that? Yes. That was pretty disastrous. Anyway, so I kind of got out. That was like, oh, what do I do with that? That's too dangerous. And other people went bankrupt. I mean, it was really rough. So I backed off, and I kind of did things here and there. Um, and I've done some alternate covers for both Marvel and DC Comics, and they keep selling them for twenty and ten dollars a piece. To, to it's this alternate cover concept, uh, not exactly fair, but nobody seems to be complaining. So there you go. So I got a bunch of covers out. It's a nice Superman cover, and new Batman, and I'm, you know, it's, I'm having fun. But we, the family, the the Adams family, kind of decided, ah, we ought to jump in. I haven't, you know, we published, I haven't got anything fresh. And what's happened is the industry is sort of caught up to what I was doing 25 years ago. You know, the paper is better. Yeah. The printing is better. We're using computer coloring. Uh, the art is better. There's a lot of, lot of really good artists. Competition is better. So I thought, well, competition's better. I kind of like that. Why don't I jump back in? So I'm doing a series of cape characters, a cape character for DC Comics. Six graphic novels wow. of a cape crusader who wears a cape and a cowl. And I can't tell you who he is because DC wants to announce it themselves. I'm on my second graphic novel, moving toward my third. I think when the third gets done in a month or two, they'll be announcing what it is. Don't be surprised if it's... <laughs> so one thing that's a little different this year is that Marvel Movement trying to go with more of a party atmosphere. Very loud. Yeah, but there's an undeniable groove. I think that's what I'm feeling. I'm not really sure. Can we, can we get this to turn? We're trying to... Rebecca Donner, uh, one of DC's newest Minx authors, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so what is the title of the book that you've got coming out? Uh, it's called Burnout, and actually here is a Ooh. copy. 
Uh, is it out yet or is that a preview copy? It's a preview copy, uh, yes. It comes out in June. June? That's a long way out. It is, it is. Yeah. I'm, it feels <laughs> like every day is uh, that the clock is ticking. Yeah. But. So, um, have you? Uh, this, this is your first comic, right? Um, yes, yeah. first graphic novel. Yeah. I, I'm a novelist. I have another novel out that was published a couple of years ago. Yeah. I write short stories, but this is my first graphic novel. So, how is the, the process of writing a novel different than writing a graphic novel? I mean, having another a collaborator involved, an artist, and yes. was that a, was a hard... Uh, challenge for you? Or? And you know it was surprisingly a lot more easy than I had thought because yeah. I'd worked with an amazing illustrator Inaki Miranda so to see my ideas sort of take visual form uh, it was it was it was interesting just because he anticipated a lot of what was going on in my head and yeah. suddenly I saw it on the page. Yeah. Um, as a novelist you have to uh, explain themes and characters and prose and and when you're writing a graphic novel sometimes you sit back and say you know maybe the visual image yeah. Can, can do that for you. So. so was it really trippy when you first started getting pages in to see like these characters who you invented? Like did they look like what you invented in your head? Or? Totally trippy. Yeah. Yes, that's the, I mean, you know, so you write, oh, her hair is tousled or his, he's got um, wearing a hoodie or something and yeah. you give the visual details, but, yeah. but the actual structure of their faces for, yeah. uh, for some sort of spooky reason he also anticipated. So wow. it was a whole symbiotic thing going cool, on. Cool, very cool. Yeah. So I heard the I heard the plot of the book is a little risque. Yes, um, well, you know, it's it's uh, the short answer when people say what is it about, I say, well, it's about eco-terrorism and, and quasi-incest. And then people say, what's quasi? And then I say, well, you'll have to read the book. But. And it's aimed at young adults, right? Uh, what's, yeah, young adults. Yeah, so no, where you get the teens in with the, the incest in, and the eco-terrorism. Yeah, yeah, no, they're all involved. They've got to learn sooner or later, right? They have to, yeah. exactly. It, it grapples with these issues in a very serious way. Excellent. Um, yeah, so. So it comes out in June, we'll be looking for it. Yeah. Hey, with artist Jamal Eigel, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, man. How's it going? Good. You're sort of all over the DC Universe this, this last year. You've yeah, been hitting uh, Teen Titans, Nightwing, Countdown, yeah. you're in Superman Tangent now. How's, yeah. it, how's it been going? It's been really, really good. Really, really busy, exhausting at certain points, especially working on Countdown. But uh, things have been really good. Yeah, I heard Countdown, you had a very short lead time up in your Yeah, I had uh, two and a half weeks to finish 20 pages, which is, even for me, is sort of like the land speed record of getting stuff done. But I think we pulled it off really well. You've got a good reputation for being someone who, who, who's on time and does quality work. Is that something you've always tried to uphold? Well, you know, I started out in editorial, so I'm always aware of deadlines and everything that's involved with that because I'm the penciler. You know, everybody else is waiting for me to get stuff done. And if I'm slow or if I got to take a break for something, that means somebody along the line is not getting paid. So I always keep that in mind whenever I'm working on a project. How many pages can you do? Uh, how, what's your rate like? My, I'm, it's about, on an average, about a page a day. But when I push, it's uh, two pages a day. Now, when you do a book like Teen Titans, you've got a lot of different characters. Is that harder to? I mean, is it, does it take longer to draw because you've got all these different people? That... No, not really. It's more about because I'm very much about characterization and body language. So I try to make everybody as individual as possible because it's easy to do sort of cookie cutter figures. But if you want to have a real like look you know you want to make everybody kind of look as individual and act as individual as possible so with a book like Teen Titans you know you want Robin to have a certain posture you want to have Kid Devil have a certain posture you want to have a certain level of cockiness to Ravager and so on and so forth so I mean those are the things that I really like doing whenever I'm working on a project and with a team book there's just more opportunity to do that now you started editorial, you became an artist, was that always your goal or how did, how did the transition happen? It actually was always my goal. I always, even when I was doing editorial, it, it was always with that eye of eventually drawing comics full time. And I just sort of got to a point after a while because I was not only doing like comics editorial for independence, but I was working a day job doing marketing and I'm working at an advertising agency at one point. Excuse me. And uh, my revelation for going freelance was just basically I got laid off and I decided there is no such thing as job security I'm just gonna freelance screw it I'm just gonna and I've been freelancing ever since sometimes being kicked out is the best exactly. impetus to get going <laughs> exactly, exactly. so was was going editorial your way to get in the, get your foot in the door so you could eventually become a, become an artist I, you know what it just I sort of stumbled into it to be honest um, it just it wasn't something that I consciously said well I'm I'm going to work editorial and then I'm going to sneak in because that's not usually how it works. Usually, even when you're on staff at a company, 
if you're doing projects at a company, I don't know, it may have changed since then, but if you're doing projects on a company and you're on staff, they take a little bit out of your check. And I know a lot of guys, a lot of guys in the past who used to write for DC who would be very, very annoyed by that idea. But it, it, was, never, it was never a conscious decision. I just wanted to work in comics. And, and, and at that point, when especially I was a lot younger, my artwork wasn't quite as strong as it is now. And it was always towards that goal of learning everything that I could possibly learn as far as, not just on the artistic side, the editorial side, but the production side as well. So you've, you've drawn a lot of characters across the DC Universe this last year. Right. Do you have a favorite, somebody you really enjoyed drawing, somebody you, really, you were really looking forward to when you got the assignment? Um, I really got into drawing the Jokester. I really did. It, that was just like, as far as like one shot projects go, that was a lot of fun. And because I got to play with so many different like images of the Joker over the years and try to adapt that to the way that I work, that made it even better. And I, that still stands right now. It's like one of the best stories that I've probably done in, all, in the last couple of years. So now you're on Superman Tangent. Can you tell everybody what, what, the, what, the, what the book's about, what, what people it, should look for? It's basically an old school Crisis on Earth 9 crossover. It's a JLA miniseries. The JLA go over to the Tangent universe accidentally to try and stop the, the psychically powered Superman and fail miserably. <laughs> But and more things happen. I can't. And it's a twelve issue. It's a year long series. Twelve. It's a year long series. Twelve issues. I'm doing the seventeen page main story with Dan Jurgens, is being inked by Robin Riggs and colored by Dom Regan. And then the backup stories are all written by Ron Mars and being penciled by Fernando Persara. Wow, excellent. Let me show you something really quick. Do you see that? Can you see it? Yeah. Right here. Right there. Gordon. Intern. Okay card. I have a card with my name on it that gives my title. Do you have that? No, I didn't think you did. So maybe you're not qualified to tell me about, oh, GoDaddy. You know, and if I head over to GoDaddy.com and I enter the coupon code iFanboy, then uh, I get 10% off my entire purchase. So I can get domain names, I can get email, I can get whatever I need. So uh, until you got a card with your little name and little intern on it, just watch yourself. And just because you can get a shirt from Jinx that says intern, no. But you can do that. Jinx.com slash iFanboy, you can get your intern shirt. I mean, I, I would recommend you do that, actually. I'm going to get back to work now. I'm here with the mighty Jeff Johns of DC Comics. Hey. We finally got tracked you down. Yeah. So, so um, one of the best surprises in comics for me in the past year has been Justice Society of America. Thank you. Um, like honestly, that book came out of nowhere for me, and it was—it's just been amazing. Thank My question you. is, is that can you cram any more characters in there? I'm hoping to cram. <laughs> I want to like out Legion the Legion. <laughs> so, um, we actually have like one more character coming in. Yeah. But a couple are going out. One's not going to make it out. Yeah. Um, so we'll see in the next few months, it, but the whole team shakes up. Yeah. So are you just having a blast, like, pulling in a lot of the Golden Age and the Legacies? Like, for an example, Our Man and Liberty Bell are my two favorite pairings. Yeah. And, like, you get one panel per issue, and I just want more of it. So well, like, the great thing about Our Man and Liberty Bell, too, what Dale Eaglesham do, yeah. Sim does is, like, um, they're on an eternal honeymoon, so they're always, like, really close to each other. Yeah. You can, you get I love so they're leaning on each yeah. other and everything. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. every character has a real strong personality that yeah. I think you can get in one panel, yeah. which is nice. That said, there will be much more exploration of, of a lot of guys. Sandman's going to get a lot of focus in the coming year. Yeah. Um, uh, Power Girl will get a lot of focus in the coming year. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned you want to out Legion the Legion, but you go from Justice Society to do, just coming off of a Superman arc with Legion. Yeah. How do you keep track of all the characters? <laughs> I don't know. I do the same things Grant does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but how much of a trip is it to be, to be kind of steering the boat with James Robinson on Superman? I mean, that, that's like Great. the... I mean, James yeah. is one of my favorite writers. He was an inspiration. Yeah. Uh, loved his work since uh, Firearm and Golden Age and all those books. Yeah. And um, uh, to, to be partnered up with James on Superman. And we just spent uh, uh, two or three days outlining Superman through 2010. So we have our, our whole story arc, all our little stories and big stories come together to form one huge... Uh, one huge kind of adventure for Superman, cool. and um, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, because the thing with Superman, at least from my scene, because I because I'm I kind of watch Superman on the sidelines, yeah. and it seems every couple of years we hear we're fixing Superman and it's going to be good. And everything need to be fixed. We just <laughs> we just want to tell good stories, and, yeah. and James and I are all about. We want these to be the books you have to read, you want to read. Right. They're fun to read, and um, and hopefully we'll do it. That's yeah. the goal. 
Cool. So then, um, with all this talk about event books and all these kind of things, the best event probably of last year was the Sinestro Corps Thanks. War. And what you're doing with Green Lantern now, I mean, the colored rings, like it seems so simple, and I'm, I don't know why it hasn't happened yet. Like, where did you come up? Like, how did you come up with that? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, but it's. Um, I'm really looking forward to all the stuff we got in Green Lantern. Obviously, yeah. it's. Um, I'm glad people have liked the book. You know, it's. Yeah. It's. Uh, Sinestro Corps was kind of just out there, and people grabbed onto it, and it's by sheer. Uh, reader reaction that it's become what it has and, and that's it's great. It's just so multifaceted and the fact that introducing the different emotions and the different colors and the different factions. Well, the of thing the... I like, my nephew saw that spread and he was like, yeah. what are all these colors? And I said, well, they all represent. I said, yeah. red's anger. And he's like, oh, what's that? I said, compassion. Yeah. That's hope. And, it, and he really got into it and I could see this is what and even the kid in us goes, well, what ring would choose me? Yeah. Like, honestly, like, what ring would come down to you? And it might depend on your state of mood. Right. Like, if you're really angry and upset, what happens? The red ring comes and takes you over because the violent takeover takes right. you and grabs you. Yeah. Um, but the idea is, like, you know, what what emotion will symbolize you? What ring will, will yeah. choose you? Sorry. And that's that's always fun to speculate. Yeah, it's very and, cool. And who in the DC Universe gets a ring? Like, what, yeah. you know, that, that's, that's the stu stuff that makes it fun. Right. And that's what I like to do, like... Uh, all the trailers and teases I've been putting in my books, I just yeah. want to make the comics a bigger experience than, the, than 22 pages a, a month. Yeah, and that's what it is. I mean, it's really immersive, and it's like, and even something like uh, like Sinestro's role now, I mean, he's almost, we, we were talking, he's almost like uh, uh, Ben Linus and Lost. Right. Like the character, like he's, yeah. who's just planting seeds and watching yeah. it all go. I mean, I assume he's going to come back, he's going to bust out at some point. Uh, yeah. Either he'll bust out, or someone yeah. will bust him out, or yeah. or he'll stay on death row and, and die. <laughs> it's probably the most unlikely, <laughs> unlikely scenario. Yeah. But he, um, um, he plays a big role in Secret Origin and uh, and Rage of the Red Lanterns because yeah. all that rage from the Red Lanterns is directed at uh, the greatest Green Lantern who ever lived, Sinestro. Yeah. So. Cool. So um, I gotta say, it must be pretty good to be Jeff Johns these days, huh? It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. I like I like being where I am, working with the artists I work with, the people I work with. Yeah. That's what makes it fun. Yeah. Collaboration makes it fun. Being here, like in. in uh, uh, it's like a second San Diego now. Yeah. Um, and the reaction, like in the DC panel today. Uh, when, yeah. Yeah. You can feel like, you know, DC Universe, the, the thing about DC Universe is, uh, the thing I like, and Dan acknowledges, is that we got to learn from what works and what doesn't work and make it better. Yeah. Check out our mistakes, admit the things that don't work, but look, how can we ratchet everything up? And that's what I try and do with my own writing. That's what I feel the DC Universe is trying to do. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to be better for it. We're here with Paul, the, uh, the iFanboy intern for the New York Comic Con. Hey. Was there anything surprising about hanging out with the uh, with the iFanboy crew uh, that you didn't expect? They don't like each other a lot. Uh, is one thing you find out. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. It's and, true. And bickering. Have you have you found it to be tough? It's tough. It's rough. It's uh, it's really arduous. It's sort of like community service, but yeah, it's rough stuff. Uh, it's sort of like those two nights I spent in a prison in Memphis. Um, but yeah, it's no. Have you have you ever had a job this demanding, this taxing? No, I don't think there is one. I really. Right. So I assume this will be your last experience with us. Oh yeah, this is it. I'm done. This is right. one-time thing. My advice to you guys out there, if you're coming to a convention, you want to set up a slip and slide covered in gold bond powder or cream, and then as you get out of bed in the morning, just right across it, all over you. Just cover yourself, and you'll be good to go for the convention. Words of wisdom from a man with experience. <laughs> I'm here with Mark Guggenheim, uh, writer of many comics. We were just going over them. You've got uh, Amazing Spider-Man. Amazing Spider-Man, Young X-Men, uh, Resurrection at Oni Press, uh, and Nowhere Man at uh, Virgin Comics. And you're executive producing a television show. I am. And I, I forgot, in Marvel Comics Presents, we're still running a series, uh, a serial uh, called Vanguard, which I forgot to mention just because I finished up all the scripts. So once I finished the scripts... Are you okay? Are you holding up all right? <laughs> I, I, I honestly, barely. Uh, barely. It's been interesting. Yeah. I, I, I'm very lucky. I honestly, I'm, I, this is going to sound totally trite, but I'm fueled by the love of the game. Like, right. that's what keeps me going. Um, I will say that, like, when the writer's strike hit and I stopped uh, working on the show, it's like you go from working on the show, working on the show, to no working on the show whatsoever. I, I realized, wow, I really have been doing a lot. I don't know how I've been doing it. It's like, it's like being in a, uh, a cold pool and not realizing how cold it was until you get out. That's what it was like. It was interesting. So 
let me ask you, uh, this sort of version of Amazing Spider-Man is more unique. Is it? Yeah. Does it feel a little more like working in a TV writer's room? It does. It's like it's like working in a TV writer's room where I'm not in charge. So, right. God, that's like the worst of both worlds. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, it's actually it's very much like a TV writer's room um, because we're all like we're all obviously breaking the same story, but we all get along well, like the way a good writing staff does for a TV show. And the weekly pace, the just the constant need for scripts, is very reminiscent of television. Do you find yourself uh, pacing the weekly books differently than you would say the monthly books, or is it pretty much working the same way? It's working the exact same way, actually, because I'm a big believer in, uh, well, I, I don't like uh, decompression. Right. I, I'm all about compression, so I'm trying to pack as much story as I can into each issue, regardless of whether it comes out monthly or weekly. Um, it's just, the, the big challenge is, you think you've got this big cushion of scripts, and then a month goes by and you don't have a cushion anymore because they've all hit the stands. Right. Uh, so it it changes your writing pace, not narratively, but just your output. So you've you've worked on really big characters uh, recently. You did Wolverine, and you got Spider Man. Is that intimidating, or does it feel like it's a natural fit, or like you know them really well? Well, I, I think first and foremost, it's lucky. I mean, I just feel really, really fortunate. Um, I, I'll say that. Uh, Spider-Man was super intimidating. Like that first arc took a lot longer for me to write than most of my comic book work. But once by the end, I really sort of felt the groove. And I always felt like Spider-Man, I had Spider-Man's voice, but I was sort of like intimidated by the, the weight of the character. And then I sort of like, you know, sort of hit my groove with my second arc. And um, I feel like, oh, okay, I can do this forever now. I, I'm, I'm comfortable. I've, I've worked past my nerves. So let me, let me in, a, in a sort of a sea of X-Men books out there, what is it that, that you can bring to the table with Young X-Men, or like, what is it the fans can look forward to with that? Well, I think what the fans can look forward to is The Unexpected. It is a book where I'm trying to build in a big surprise every issue, where I'm laying in seeds in you know issue one and issue two that you won't see come to fruition until issue 12 or beyond. So there's a, there should be a lot of unexpected stuff. There should be a lot of, there's a lot of advanced planning going on. Like I'm doing things that I know I'm not gonna pay off for another year or so. That's really cool. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and also just, this is where you'll get the, you know, no pun intended, the young X-Men. You know, all the other X-Men, they're, they're, you know, they're older, they're more mature, they're more experienced. These guys are very raw, very inexperienced, and as a result of the first arc, will be placed in a position where they don't trust anybody else. They don't trust other mutants. So in addition to the whole, um, uh, you know, angst of being a young mutant, they also now have to face the angst of being a young mutant and not being able to lean on the older mutants for advice and experience. And, and lest I give all of the time to the Marvel books, uh, I wanted to ask you about your, your only ongoing series. They don't do a lot of ongoing series, so... No, no. In, in fact, it's very special because um, one thing that we're announcing at the convention is they also don't do a lot of color books. In fact, they don't do any color books. Resurrection is going to be one of the first. Okay. We're going to relaunch the book with volume two. Um, it'll be in color. We're going to go back and recolor the first six issues in a trade paperback. Uh, we're doing an annual. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. And it's for, for those of you who don't know what the book is, it's it's very simple. It's it's one of the only high concept ideas I've ever had. Which is it's War of the Worlds. It's Day of the Earth stood still. It's Independence Day. Those movies end, and boom, resurrection begins. The aliens have left the planet. We've kicked them off. What now? How do we rebuild the world? Who's in charge? Everyone's fighting with each other. It's a real sort of storm and drong, uh, scary kind of book. Um, but it's so much fun, and just there's more story in that concept than I could ever tell in a million issues. So for me, what's fun is cherry picking the best stories to tell and the most interesting ones. And you know, we'll be shifting POV, and we'll be seeing other countries, and we'll be having a, an incredibly huge cast. It's it's just a lot of fun. We're here with Grant Morrison. Um, you just spent the last year or so writing Batman. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe his place in the DC Universe? Oh, it's pretty central. I mean, everyone in the world knows who Batman is, so he's one of the, the, the main two superhero characters ever created, probably. He represents the darkness, Superman represents the light. 
on Superman, uh, Wonder Woman's the boobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is now a good time to to change it up, get rid of them, or whatever it is coming happening. Well, I just I, mean, I just like to move the story along. You know, there's a lot. When I was doing the book, I, I read back through the Batman's entire history and then got the basic idea of imagine everything that I've just read had happened to one guy in the mm -hmm. space of 15 years, and it's a hell of a life when you yeah. think of it like that. So the notion was to just keep rolling the story along, see what, what new things we could do. And because I'd read all these old stories, there was a ton of stuff I thought, no one's ever gone back to this or dealt with what that would mean in someone's real life. Is that where the, the going back to the Son of the Demon and the, and the Child came from? Yeah, pretty much. Going back to things like Son of the Demon, even going back to the old 50s and mm -hmm. 60s stories like Robin Dies at Dawn and the kind of weird Zebra Batman right. stuff. And I wanted to try and find a way that would integrate that into the kind of Frank Miller year one world view of Batman and see how we could tie even the weirdest stuff into Batman's career. So, yeah, I mean, I found some really interesting old stories and little germs of things that led me on to this big evil mastermind story that we're doing right now. So, so is this, where you're going now with the, with the RIP storyline, is that something you, from the beginning you thought, I'm going to look, I looked at everything and I'm going to change it all, or did it come through writing it through the course of the writing? Yeah, well, I had the story figured. I knew that I was going to end this thing with a story called Batman RIP, mm -hmm. and I'd worked this thing out. But then I spoke to Dan DeDeo, you know, DC's uh, head man, and Dan said, no, if you're going to call it that, you really have to take it seriously. So that that allowed me to go even further with it, which is, it's ended up, it's a lot stronger. It's a lot were you surprised that you were allowed to go that further with it? I was a little bit, but it was, you know, it's good. They, they were open to the ideas. And because it's not just, it's not just about getting rid of something, it's about actually developing the story and giving readers something to really look forward to, surprises that they've never had before, mm -hmm. and ways of looking at Batman that maybe haven't been done before. And now you're all, and not, if that's not enough, you're also doing Final Crisis, which is yeah. coming out soon. Is there any pressure in writing a crisis story? I mean, there's, these are the seminal DC tales. The Crisis on Infinite Earth is one of the most famous tales of all time. Is there any pressure involved in that? I don't really feel pressure about doing this job. I mean, I've been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just, uh, this is a great thing for me to get hold of a crisis. I did the One Million story back mm -hmm. in the 90s, which was a big crossover. But this one actually kind of ties together all the threads of every parallel reality story since Flash of Two Worlds back in the 60s. Wow. So we were looking through all the crises from Crisis on Earth 1 and Crisis on Earth X and all of those things and trying to do a story that's actually the ultimate parallel Earths. Sounds that, like yeah. fun. I mean, it looks like you, you're sort of lighting up when you're talking about the, yeah, all the exactly. research. exactly. You can see I'm enjoying it. You know, it's, <laughs> I mean, I, I love these characters and I also love pushing them into places we haven't seen them before. Is there someone we should keep our eye on for the for Final Crisis? Somebody who's really going to shine someone we may not think of i think the supergirl thing is going to be interesting for people because i've got a real take on her that i think makes the character really resonate the way she should so but everyone's in there you know i mean i could i've run through 10 15 guys here but supergirl's the one that's really kind of getting me excited now and uh, why not you know? <laughs> <laughs> how is it working with jg jones on uh, interiors i mean he's, it's been a while since he's done an in, inside book no the guy's just a genius you know like i was saying on the panel with him today He's done this sequence in the second issue where a uh, terrible Turpin, the cop, is like beating the hell out of uh, the Mad Hatter with a toilet seat. <laughs> and you, you know, you describe that stuff and you imagine how that might look with any ordinary comic mm -hmm. artist and it just be swiping out. This looks for real, you know, the Mad Hatter's mm -hmm. crawling across the floor, there's blood up the walls and Turpin's just actually just hitting into him. And the way he brings the, these things to life is like no one else at all. It's, well, it's a, a pleasure to get the pages when you see him. It's just amazing. Everything he draws is great. It's like Frank Quitely's the same. You know, mm. you just ask him to draw something, and what you get back is ten times what you imagined. So this, we seem to be in an era of the comic book writer rock star, mm. um, and your name is always at the top of the list whenever that comes up. And you're, we see you at the convention. You're being led around by staff security. Is that, yeah. is that, is that something that's strange to be sort of in this place where you're basically a rock star? No, I've always been a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I was the guy that invented it. You know, I, I came out of bands. I mean, that yeah. was the culture I came from, art school, punk rock, you mm -hmm. know. So for me, it was always about that kind of, you know, flamboyance and mm -hmm. dressing up. Because you've got to give something to your readers, right. you know. I mean, you're the guy that they, they, they're projecting a lot of stuff onto you. So I think you have to try a little bit harder and be something for them, you know. So I've always enjoyed that aspect of it. I mean, the, the real truth is you go back home and you're sitting in a room for <laughs> 10 hours a day and s I'm certainly not a rock star. So it's good to put on a suit and come and be... Exactly, you know, you know and come and hang out and see people and <laughs> see the world in the daylight again. <laughs> <laughs> so after Final Crisis ends, you're still on Batman. What, what does the future hold for Graham Morrison? Uh, just keeping on with Batman after Final Crisis. I'm going to take a break from superheroes other than Batman for maybe a year or two and really, I want to rethink the whole genre you know, mm -hmm. and come back with something that will really blow everyone's minds. In between time, I've just got a bunch of new creator projects coming out from Vertigo, which mm. will fill in the gap. Excellent. Thanks for talking to us. And You're welcome. All right, we're here with our friend Ash from San Francisco. How are you doing, Ash? Howdy, everybody. Um, so you, you won one of the CBLDF raffles. I did, yeah. yeah. Just for those of you who don't know,
don't know, the CBLDF is the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. They help out uh, creators need, with need of uh, legal services and, and comic book stores. Anybody who needs help, uh, they are a fantastic organization to support, and, and that's what you did. And they're always here at the con, and they've got a lot of exclusives, they got stuff signed, they've got great stuff that they sell, but they also raffle stuff. And you entered a bunch in the raffle, didn't you? I did, I, yeah, I donated a few bucks. You had a couple of things on uh, your eyes on? Yeah, totally. Did you win anything you wanted? Um, I, I, I won. You won? What'd you win? I, I won uh, I won a comic. You won a comic book? Yeah. Awesome. Which one? Um, this. Wow. That is a Michael Turner's Fathom Volume 2, number 0, Wizard, Wizard World, World Los Angeles, Angeles exclusive. It's a 9.8. So is the story any good? I, I don't know. I, Why don't you know? Because I can't read it. Because it's slabbed by the CGC, which means that as long as it's in this plastic thing, it's worth some money, apparently. You know what the thing is, though? I've always wondered how you get something out of there. I'd maybe like to take a look at some of the interiors. I've always wish I wanted to break the shit out of one of these before. <laughs> do you mind? Can I join in on the fun? Please do. Let's right. do it. Awesome. Okay. All right, how are we going to do this, guys? Let's, start, let's jump on it. Go for it. That's, that's wait, that's, that's, that's not. Oh, oh there we go. Oh, we're, we're in. We're wait, in. Wait, wait, okay, wait, hold on. Wait, wait. Oh, hey! Oh, All right, we've okay. broken the seal. We've broken the seal. I oh, wait, no! There's, there's, oh, there's, there's another a secondary one. There's seal. Another seal. This is oh, hermetically. God. We'll never get in. Holy shit! To read the comic book. Wait, no! Oh, we're going. We're getting... oh. There, we've we've touched the actual paper. There it is. Oh, oh we're almost there. there. It is. And now, uh, oh, it. the adventures of Fathom can now be enjoyed fully. There's nothing on this page. Oh, wait, oh my God! <laughs> oh, there, oh, that's lovely. That's gonna be you see, and you read the comic book. I'm so happy I can I finally read my story. That's excellent, excellent, good work. Well, I, I don't want to read. You want it? No, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. no, not really. Thanks, guys. So there is yet another convention wrapped up. New York Comic Con 2008 is all done, and we are alive and kicking. We are. There it is. Let's not jinx ourselves. <laughs> we <can laughs> We're going to call it a day, a weekend. It's been fun. Um, so if you enjoyed this episode and you have any questions about the con, you can email us at contact.ifanboy.com. Or you can call, leave us a voicemail at 888-FANBOYS, which is 326-2697. And as always, get yourself over to ifanboy.com for all the stuff that's there. Uh, and then check out the mini episodes we got coming out every single weekday. And you can get those at ifanboy or at revision3.com slash ifanboy. There's going to be mini related episodes before and after this. Still, there's more Comic-Con than we can even fit in this show. Uh, and that's all. So thanks very much, and we'll see you tomorrow and every day. to another episode of iFanboy. I'm Ron. And I am Josh. I'm Connor. And we are here at the New York Comic Con. And it's big this year. It's, it's big and beautiful. It's like, it's much better than it was before. So, so it seems that way. It's also, <laughs> it's a BBW. That's what it is.